Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We join you today from the North Central Research Station at La Homa to talk about OSU wheat variety development. That's coming up a little later, but first here is entomologist Tom Royer to talk about his research with SUNUP's Curtis Hare. We're talking crops and insects right now with our extension entomologist, Tom Royer. And Tom, tell us about some of your research that you have been looking at in regards to using insecticide for nitrogen applications. Okay, uh, about four or five years ago, it became a common practice among producers to just throw in a really uh, inexpensive insecticide application in with their top dress application. They just said, well, we're going across the field anyway, why not throw it in? Uh, my first reaction was, why, why use an insecticide if you don't know what you're using it for? And I thought, well, I'm just going to put out some research and prove these guys wrong. It turns out I couldn't prove them wrong. It actually, we, over the last four, three or four years of research, we've shown that it does provide a benefit. We have data from three locations in, in three different years. Uh, that shows there's a benefit to adding it. So what I want to do is help a producer decide, make a decision on whether it's going to provide a benefit or not. And that's what we're doing right now is to try and add on a little bit of data to help make that decision. You know, um, the, uh, the winter crops are, crops are coming along, the wheat's looking good across the state. Um, briefly kind of talk about some of the insect pressure, if any, that has been, you know, impacting some of our, like canola or wheat. Um, well, there is a little bit of, uh, um, you know, my, one of my colleagues, John Damacone, has some canola plots. The canola looks beautiful this year. It, I mean, it's as good as it's looked in a long time. It's up to here, up to my chin. I wouldn't want to have to go out and scout, but there is a little bit of aphid pressure in his plots, and so I think he's going to have to treat, but otherwise it looks like a great crop. Um, we haven't seen a lot of insect pressure in a lot of our wheat. Um, a little earlier we had army cutworm issues and there was probably some bird cherry oat aphid that was building up in certain areas but for the most part it's looking beautiful i mean that's a fantastic you know you, you mentioned uh you mentioned aphids in there um you actually have some exciting news in regards to a sugarcane aphid app yes. um, that's that's coming along quite quite well yeah we are wanting to have it um, out in people's hands this summer before the sugarcane aphid uh, season comes along it is a system that uh, allows them to go out and sample a field and determine whether they need to treat or not. But the beauty of it is, is it's, it's a rapid system. It can make that decision very quickly. I think it's going to be a big time saver, uh, but it's just a question of getting, and it, it's great because they can record for each field what the decision was, and they know when they get finished that they, they can say treat fields one and three and field two didn't need to be treated. So it will keep that kind of information on their phone for them. And I think it's gonna be a time saver. All right, thanks, Tom. Tom Royer, Extension Entomologist here at Oklahoma State University. with your weekly Mesonet weather report. Oklahoma's weather patterns this year have seen a little bit all over the place. Extreme heat, severe weather, a late freeze, and now a record-breaking cold in May. On May 12th, the daily high temperatures failed to get out of the 50s for most areas of the state. In the northwest region, they struggled to reach 50. At Beaver and the May Ranch sites, they maxed out at 47 degrees for the day. The all-time record lowest high temperatures for that day are shown in this map of co-op sites. This week's temperatures recorded by Mesonet were cooler in almost every county, sometimes more than 10 degrees. Looking at the state as a whole is illustrated in this graph. The blue fill line is the Mesonet 15-year average high temperatures for the first two weeks in May. The dark line is the actual statewide high temperatures recorded for each day. After a warm start to the month, things changed dramatically. On Tuesday, the state average temperature was 55.1. That is almost 23 degrees below the long-term average. 
If you're ready for cotton planting weather, things are looking up. Next week, the temperatures are predicted to be much higher than normal, as indicated by reds over Oklahoma in this map. Now here's Gary, focusing on rainfall and the spreading drought. Thanks, Wes, and good morning, everyone. Well, it was certainly a cool week across Oklahoma. That probably helped us from getting too much worse in the drought category. Let's take a look at that latest drought monitor map and see exactly what we have. Well, really, it's the same basic pattern we've seen over the last few weeks, but now we have a little bit of a dollop of moderate drought down in the far southwestern parts of the state in Beckham County. So drought is starting to spread uh, up and down the Texas uh, Oklahoma border. So that's an area we're going to have to watch as we go through the next few weeks if we don't get rainfall. Speaking of rainfall, what have we seen over the last 30 days? Well, if we look down in the southwestern parts of the state, we still have less than an inch in those areas, uh, at least uh, through May 12th, but we do have some areas in western Oklahoma that have had two to three inches. Those actual deficits for the last 30 days, again, looking at the mesonet departure from normal rainfall map, more than two and a half inches in parts of southwest Oklahoma, and of course all across that far western tier of counties. The deficits in the eastern parts of the state aren't quite as important because they've had lots of rainfall uh, previous to this 30-day period. So the drought uh, map that we look at really predicated on those deficits uh, that we're seeing out in western Oklahoma. Well again, the darker reds and oranges are the worst areas, uh, but the same story across much of the uh, far western Oklahoma and again, the far western panhandle. And we can see the uh, vegetation condition across West Oklahoma scattered about. In some cases, it's near normal, but lots of pre-drought stress and also moderate to severe drought colors starting to show up. So the next 30 days are probably the key for getting us out of this drought situation across West Oklahoma. That is the key rainy period in the state, at least for most of the state. Out in the Panhandle, it's a little bit more predicated on the summer rainfall but it is an important time frame, so let's keep an eye on that, and we'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Dr. Brett Carver joins us now at Lahoma to talk all things wheat research. Let's talk first about the beardless variety, starting with OK Corral. What do you want people to know? Well, this was recently released. This is our latest release out of the program, 2019 to be exact. Uh, this is a very different variety in terms of the way it looks and the way it can be used. Uh, in the field. Uh, we call it beardless, of course. Uh, others call it onless. It came out of our bearded breeding pipeline. It, it, it wasn't so much an accident, but it really wasn't expected uh, given the cross and the, and the genetics that we were working with. OK Corral is, it resulted from a cross of three lines, one of which was a Midwestern soft wheat. Uh, another was a sieve of OK Bullet. Everybody's familiar with Bullet now. Um, and the other is a Eastern European Ukrainian uh, line uh, combined with some pioneer genetics. So what we were trying to do with that, with that hodgepodge is to bring in disease resistance from different sources, soft wheat from Eastern European uh, germplasm and meld it into our mainstream breeding. But in the process, we had a beardless wheat come out of it. And this happens quite often. It, it, it really happened with the variety Deliver, which is our standard. Uh, for beardless wheat, uh, released in 2004. Now we've had a, a beardless since then called Pete. Uh, didn't quite measure up to, to deliver uh, in the long term because of disease resistance. Uh, but deliver is one that we really want to uh, to match in terms of that agronomic uh, uh, quality and in use or baking quality. And I think we had that now in OK Corral. I really believe this is a variety that's going to uh, take hold in Oklahoma. Uh, it's going to handle a lot of things, a lot of problems we have typically in our state. Um, and two, it just has a good yield potential. Uh, it, it was our top yielding experimental line in our elite trial last year. That's incredible for a beardless wheat, knowing the history that we've had. You and the team have some other experimental beardless varieties in the pipeline. Let's take a look. That's correct, yes. What do we have here? We have two on display here at Lahoma, and there are many, many more, of course. Uh, the pipeline has finally been built back up. We have some really good stripe rust resistant germplasm now, two of which are, are on display here. The 11208E is a cross of Santa Fe and Deliver. So we're bringing that Deliver genetics, re reworking it back into the program. I honestly thought this was going to be the one that we would release in 2019 not OK Corral. Um, 
but we had some problems with its uniformity. I learned that as we studied this line closely, we had three maturity groups. And so we, we separated those out. You see the E in the name, well that means this is the earlier version. The later versions had test weight that were not acceptable. The maturity was so late that we were really hurting test weight, so we stayed with this earlier version. However, uh, in yield trials and uh, in quality trials, uh, the OK Corral passed it. So instead of sticking with this one, we were now using it as a, as a, as a, as a standby uh, for OK Corral. It probably won't be released, but uh, it's one that we spent a lot of time on. I wanted to mention it because it's a very good looking uh, wheat variety. This other one, 717T-6W, actually came out of Art Klatt's breeding program. So it features some germplasm, again, across the world, not just Oklahoma germplasm. But I really like this experimental line, not because it's beardless, but because of its disease resistance. As good as OK Corral, maybe a little bit better in terms of handling some of these leaf spotting diseases that Dr. Hunger has talked about so much this year. You can see the canopy on it. It's quite green, and we call it green to the ground. Um, I, I think there's a place for this. It, however, produces a white kernel. OK Corral is a red kernel. So a white wheat would have to be managed and marketed a little bit differently. We have one more variety to talk about this week that looks promising, what you're calling 89er. Yes, and it's just uh, an experimental name for now, but we'll, uh, we'll see what we come up with in terms of a commercial name. But we started crossing with germplasm that featured resistance to barley elder. Uh, we have some tolerance to that disease, but we don't have good outright resistance. And that was brought in through um, uh, a related uh, species to wheat called Thenopyrum, otherwise called interme intermediate wheatgrass. We were able to acquire that germplasm, cross it with 15 years ago with a variety called Duster. And we produced an experimental line that I like to kind of call the Duster Diamond. It has just been a, a, a diamond to us in our breeding program for many, many things. Quality, besides that, a disease resistance. So it was with that Duster Diamond we crossed with Bentley to produce OK16D101089, and I am just uh, thrilled to see this uh, barley yellow dwarf resistance come through. We saw it in the Duster Diamond, but we didn't quite have everything else lined up. But this one I think we do, and Bentley helped us out in that regard. This is a, uh, this is a canopy that's quite healthy, and it will be healthy till the bitter end. Uh, the heads will start turning, and there should be green leaves still on this canopy. Great conversation. Thank you very much for sharing all of this, and we will continue talking again next week. Great. Thank you. Every spring at this time, I like to bring a reminder to those cow-calf producers here in Oklahoma that are using artificial insemination uh, for their cows or replacement heifers. And this is especially important for any of those that might be using AI for the very first time. And that is to go through what I consider the realistic expectations of what to look for in terms of an outcome of an artificial insemination program. I'm going to introduce you to three terms that are, are important that we understand so that we have a better idea of what to expect and perhaps an idea then of if we have dis disappointing results, what areas we might look to to improve in the future. The, the first term I want to talk about is what I call estrus response. And what that refers to is just the percentage of cows that we're trying to put in an AI program, the percentage that would respond to the estrus synchronization program that we choose, or the percentage that if we choose to try to breed on heat detection, the percentage that we actually correctly identify as being in standing heat and bring them in and do the AI. Then of those that we actually detect or respond to our ester synchronization program, what's the percentage of those that we inseminate that conceive to that insemination? And that's called the AI conception rate. Really good, talented AI technicians expect to get about 70% of those that they inseminate to actually conceive. Our estrus response, or the percentage that actually respond to the synchronization, 
maybe around 80%. Then of that 80, what percentage of those actually conceived? And like we say in a good AI program, 70% of those 80 would actually conceive. So if you multiply those two things together, then you would see that what you'd end up with is 56% of the cows that you started with actually conceiving and becoming pregnant to the artificial insemination program. So I think you want to keep that in mind as realistic expectations of what you should look for as an outcome of a good AI program. The next question that will show up then is how many cleanup bulls do I need to put in with those cows after we've done our AI program and still we want to make sure the rest of those cows have a chance to get bred. Well, the, the data is pretty clear on that, that we probably need to expect to put in about one bull for every 50 cows that we started with in this AI project because half of those uh, in most situations should have been bred to AI, which leaves only about 25 cows per bull that he still needs to uh, find and impregnate so that we have a real high total pregnancy rate at the end of the breeding season. We think if you have a better understanding of what goes into the different steps of an AI program, you'll have more realistic expectations and have a better chance to have a real successful breeding program not only this spring, but in future springs as well. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SunUp's Cow-Calf Corner. It's been an interesting few weeks to say the least. And Daryl, where are we with cattle production and, and slaughter numbers? Well, you know, the last four or five weeks uh, really has been a challenge as COVID-19 uh, impacted the workforce in these meat packing plants. Uh, we started um, uh, about five weeks ago seeing uh, uh, cattle slaughter and beef production go down. It got progressively worse for four weeks in a row. Uh, the week ending May 2nd appears to be the worst week. Cattle slaughter was down 38 uh, percent, leading to a similar kind of reduction in beef production. Last week's estimated slaughter was, was up somewhat. It's still about 32 percent below a year ago, uh, but it was up six point something percent from, uh, from the week before. So I think we're making progress now. We should see this capacity come back online in the next few weeks. What, what has been um, enabling that change? Well, I, you know, obviously we just it, it, slowly working our way through the different plants that have been impacted and through the workers and getting them well. It's kind of a rolling process of, of uh, you know, each plant dealing with the issues that it has locally and, uh, and, and getting the workers well. And so I think at this point we, we continue to make progress. We could still have some setbacks, but it doesn't seem too likely at this point. This whole process relies on the, uh, on the step in front of it and the step in front of it and the step in front of it. Let's, let's take it back to the cattle producers. What should they be looking for in the next couple weeks? Well, obviously we've created a significant backlog of fed cattle over the last few weeks by not being able to process them in a timely fashion. So we've got some immediate problems right there that we're gonna to try to work through in the next few weeks. It'll take several weeks, perhaps a couple of months to work through this. Uh, and, and really what, that's, uh, what that translates into for the entire industry, all the way back to the feeder cattle level, is a need to sort of slow cattle down and, uh, and give, give the system time to sort of catch up. And so that's kind of what's out there right now. Uh, feedlots are, are placing cattle relatively slowly because they're, uh, they're not moving them out very fast. Uh, and so that means that cattle out in the country are also uh, basically slowing down a little bit. Uh, some of those big feeder cattle really need to be in a feedlot, but we're gonna try to hold them out a little bit longer uh, and give them some time. That is cattle and beef. How are things on the, on the pork and poultry fronts? Well, similar story in general, especially on the pork side. The difference is, of course, pork has less flexibility than cattle, and so we are euthanizing some hogs. Um, you know, those backlogs uh, are very severe there. Poultry side, we've euthanized a few chickens, but really not very many, hasn't changed the overall production. So again, it's just kind of working through this and uh, trying to get caught back up on all fronts. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Darrell Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University.
Johnson grass is a common invasive grass across Oklahoma. Um, it can really be a problem uh, in some areas, but it's also a forage. Uh, livestock readily graze it, and a lot of producers use it as part of their forage base. And often, in a situation where we have cattle, uh, Johnson grass stays under control. The cattle usually keep it suppressed. However, areas where we don't have livestock that we're managing for other objectives such as wildlife, Johnson grass is one of the most problematic grasses that we deal with in Oklahoma. I'm standing here in a right of way adjacent to a, a forested site that we're slowly opening up. We're allowing sunlight to come into the forest floor to manage it for white-tailed deer and wild turkey. So as this sunlight increases, Johnson grass is going to invade that forested area. So before that becomes a big problem on this 80 acre block, I want to deal with the Johnson grass that's in this small confined area uh, where there's more sunlight. So this is an ideal situation to control this plant before it becomes a larger issue. There's several herbicides you can use. Um, if it's just isolated patches of solid Johnson grass, glyphosate works. But if it's mixed in with other desirable plants that you don't want to kill, uh, you would use either sulfa sulfuron or a mazepic. Either one of those is effective on Johnson grass and there's quite a few native plants that those don't impact, uh, um, but look at the label carefully before you apply it. And, but either glyphosate, sulfa sulfuron, or a mazepic would be the herbicides of choice. And try to control Johnson grass uh, before it gets too large. You know, when it's up at 12 uh, inches up to about waist high is a, is a good time to think about spraying. So we're talking early summer would be ideal. And Johnson grass is fairly easy to identify Off, often, especially when it's young, it'll have these purplish uh, tipped leaves. And as it gets older, the key diagnostic feature is that the midrib is white. And there are only two grasses in Oklahoma that really have those characteristics of a white midrib. That's Johnson grass and eastern gamma grass. And you want to be able to distinguish those because gamma grass is a highly desirable native plant. Um, and the best way to distinguish uh, those two is Johnson grass will typically have leaves arising off a central stem as, as it elongates, whereas gamma grass, most of the leaves arise from near the base of the plant, near the ground. So that's the easiest way. And those are really the only two that you might confuse for each other. But uh, tr for areas where you don't have livestock, uh, helping you suppress Johnson grass, really try to get on these invasions quick because it will spread rapidly. The 2021 Wazza report just came out and Kim, how does it compare with expectations? I think it came in pretty close to expectations. So let's start with wheat. What are the wheat numbers looking like? Well, if you look at uh, wheat and production for the United States, it came in at uh, 1,866,000,000 bushels. That's right near, I mean, pretty close to what the pre-release estimates was. You look at last year, it was a little over 1.9 billion bushels. You look at the world, 28.2 billion bushels. That's a new record. I beat last year's record of uh, 28.1 billion bushels. You look at the Black Sea area, Remember, uh, Russian production is supposed to be uh, lower, uh, or Ukraine lower, Russian higher, uh, Kazakhstan about the same. They came in at uh, 4 uh, billion, 354 million bushels. Uh, you look at uh, last year, it was uh, 4 billion, 198, so about uh, 156 million more bushels out of the Black Sea. Hard red winter in, uh, in the U.S., uh, 733 uh, million bushels. That's 100 million less than last year. Oklahoma came in at 102.6 million bushels compared to 110 last year. Uh, you look at any stocks, I think that's a good number for price. U.S. down to 909, I think that was a surprise. We was expecting it to be a little lower than that. The world at 11.4 billion. That's a record, beat this year's record. At, that was 10.8. Uh, the Black Sea areas, 482 million. You know, we've been talking about the building stocks a little bit. Well, they're not building it all that much. Uh, you know, it was 391 last year versus 482 this year. So what about the corn numbers? What are they looking like? <laughs> oh, they're ugly. 
Well, and, uh, unless you want production. If you want production, a U.S. production at 16 billion bushels, you know, compared to 13.7 last year. Their record was 14.3, so just a lots of corn. You look at the world production, 46.7 compared to 43.9. We got, we got corn for this next year, at least if we get it produced. Ending stocks for the United States going up from 2.1 billion bushels to 3.3 billion, uh, record in record. A world going from 12.4 to 13.4, so lots of corn. So, but, but what about soybeans? Are, so, are soybeans any better than corn? Oh, they're, they're higher. Uh, all across the board, we've got increased production in the crops this year. You look at soybeans, 4.1 billion bushels compared to 3.6 uh, last year. Now, the record soybeans is 4.4, so we still haven't got there. You look at the world, 13.3 billion bushels compared to 12.4, so higher. Any stocks, though, lots of soybean use. That's the good, the good news on soybeans. Any stocks for the U.S. going down to 405 million bushels, down from 580. Remember, we was at 900 plus uh, two years ago. World uh, down to 3.6 billion compared to 3.7 last year. So soybeans, I think, is a better situation, still higher production. So the past few weeks that we've talked, in the past couple months actually, uh, cotton's been kind of, as you would say, wallering around. How did they fare with this in the Wazir report? Uh, cotton came in about like the others, not quite as bad. You look at uh, production in the U.S. down slightly to 19.5 million bales, down from 19.9. The world, uh, 119 million bales, down from 122.7, so that's relatively good. Ending stocks, though, a uh, use in uh, cotton looks like it's going to be down next year. 7.7 .7, uh, million bushels ending stocks, up from 7.1 for the U.S. The world, 99.4 up from 97.2. So lower cotton production, but higher ending stock. All righty, Kim. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime online at sunup.okstate.edu, and also follow us on YouTube and social media. From the North Central Research Station at Lahoma, I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.